Bitcoin is absolute complete openness. Nothing about the rules, the monetary theory in any way is obscured. It is more open than anything could possibly be open. And it's got nothing to do with trust. Full audit or nothing. I don't care what your class is. I don't care what your religion is or your skin color. None of that matters. I verify the rules 100% and I could care less whether you're a six-year-old kid in Bangladesh who wants to trade with me or a multi-billion dollar oil tycoon. Welcome to PayPod, the show that features thought-provoking interviews with leaders and entrepreneurs in the payments and financial technology industries. From credit card processing to Bitcoin, we cover it all. So if you want to know what's happening right now in the payments industry, stay tuned. Now, here's your host, Scott Hawksworth. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Scott here, bringing you yet another episode of PayPod, the payments podcast. We've got an excellent show on tap today, where we're going to be jumping back into a discussion on Bitcoin. And this time we're going to be covering things like the philosophy of it and its most ardent supporters, where it stands now, and so much more. And my expert guest for this show is Guy Swan, who has been learning about Bitcoin and its associated technologies for over seven years. And in fact, he's taken what he's learned and applies it to his very own podcast, the Crypto Economy Podcast, which is just a fantastic listen. I would highly recommend you check it out. We're all about hearing from as many knowledgeable perspectives as we can on this show. So we are so lucky to have Guy take some time to join me to discuss some Bitcoin. Guy, welcome to the show. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Love the introduction. Much appreciated. Bitcoin expert. I like it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, to start us off, can you tell us just a bit about your journey into the world of Bitcoin, how you became the expert? What led you to it? And how'd you end up starting the Crypto Economy podcast? And what's it all about? Yeah, well, it's probably been about seven years now. It was pretty early on, like Bitcoin was basically a non-existent thing on the radar. I was, I've always been a bit of a nerd, but at the time I was doing like film production, but I've always been like an idea guy. That was kind of my love for stories was that they were like meticulously designed arcs of like a character. And I loved how nuanced and specific things had to be to make the story invisible to the audience. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I loved that about like story and stuff. And that's why like I thought of myself as a filmmaker for 10 to 15 years there. But my brother was studying economics and we're both like super stubborn and bullheaded. So (laughs) we would debate about these types of things constantly. And I think that's probably what made his professors hate him a little bit was that like he would point out contradictions like that. Like he would just be like on it immediately and they would be like, well, that's just how it is. He's like, well, that doesn't make sense. What you taught us yesterday negates this. If what we learned yesterday was true, what you're teaching us today is bullshit. And they would be like, no, that's what the textbook says. It's like, well, you understand the textbook has to be wrong. Reality does not contradict itself. (laughs) So we would go through this and then he would come home and he'd debate with me. He's like, can you believe he said this? And then we would argue about it and many loud debates about all that stuff. And so we started just kind of exploring online and finding out that there were all these different economic theories that have just kind of been brushed under the rug. Basically, everything that was inconvenient for government, we're just not going to talk about this. And we stumbled upon the Austrian theory and... Things just started to click and stuff that were like huge contradictions suddenly were just this overarching theory, like like pricing in time into markets. There's hardly anything in the entire Keynesian economic theory that talks anything about the price of time. I mean, what is more critical to human life than having something now versus having something in a year? Obviously, that's priced in somehow. How does that take place? So this just this awesome theory. And so we just dove into this. And in a conversation with some anarchists on some forum somewhere that he was debating with, one of the guys was like, man, if you're really into this, you would probably be interested in Bitcoin. He looked it up and sent me a message and then came home that night and we were down the rabbit hole because Bitcoin is essentially an experiment in Austrian theory of monetary theory. And we were full in, like I was sold and we were just 
absolutely penniless, but there was no nothing else to focus on at the time. I just it was the most fascinating thing in the world to me. So it was kind of a joint love of ideas, computers and Austrian economics at the time. So I kind of hit it from all three different directions. And this was like the perfect toy that played in every single one of those areas, <laughs> right, you know. Yeah. And with the podcast, I'm a little bit embarrassed that it took me six years to get started because I've learned so much just myself with the podcast by forcing myself essentially to, you know, there's so many things that you like, you'll skim an idea when you're just reading it for you. Mm -hmm. But when you realize that there's an audience and other people want to explore it, you realize it's like, oh, well, I only read two paragraphs of this article last time. Like, let me sit down and read the whole thing and, you know, break it down piece by piece. That's pretty much how the podcast started is after three years of trying to start a podcast, my brother and I started two or three different times maybe throughout that process and just never published anything. I finally just sat down one day and I was like, I'm done with this. There's so many articles that I want to listen to or that I wish I had audio of. And I just sat down one day. I was like, I'll do the one that makes the audio for it and started a podcast. Yeah. And what kind of things do you tend to cover on your podcast? You know, I mean, it's just there's so much to cover in the world of Bitcoin and blockchain technology and all of this. Do, do you have like a specific focus or is it just this specific subject is interesting to me and my audience, you know, is asking about it or, you know, what's kind of your philosophy there? It's a little bit of both. It's pretty much anything around Bitcoin, but the, like the name crypto economy was about, like I actually took that username before altcoins were even really a thing. That was just always something that I had in my mind. It's actually meant to mean an economy that's cryptographically proven or cryptographically managed. It's managed with smart contracts, digital signatures, and that kind of thing. So originally, and this is really still the case, I kind of include BitTorrent and these other technologies as part of the crypto economy, but Bitcoin is kind of the thing that's in really enabling it as a market economy. Um, so it's really like, cypherpunk history, like what were the precursors to Bitcoin, the philosophy of Bitcoin, uh, technological breakdown, uh, monetary theory and economics, anything around understanding what the crypto economy is, what challenges it has to sort out to kind of come to fruition and everything along those lines. That's pretty much the focus of the podcast. So it's pretty broad, but it's also pretty centered around Bitcoin. That makes a ton of sense. You know, I love this question. I've asked several other Bitcoin expert guests this and crypto experts. I really enjoy the answers. How would you define or describe Bitcoin to someone who has no idea? What is Bitcoin? Okay, this is a difficult one. And you do get a very, very wide array of answers with it. Um, Bitcoin is it's a set of rules in trade, in exchange. Think about your bank. Like, do you trust your bank? They've never cheated anything that all the accounting is solid. And when you put a dollar in the bank, there's only a do they're only using a dollar on their side. Like, do you trust that's happening at your bank? Yeah, I think I have to trust that. <laughs> you, you have to. You have to. That's exactly right. Now imagine you could audit everything that your bank did. Imagine you could audit it this morning and know without beyond any question that they haven't created money out of thin air, which actually they legally do. I mean, if you know how banking works with fractional reserve and rehypothecation, if you put $10 in the bank, they say, oh, yeah, I'll give you back this $10. But they have the legal right to just invent another $10 out of thin air, loan it to somebody else and earn interest on it. It's a money printing machine, essentially, which is why prices in the economy, you know, when I was your age, I bought steaks <laughs> for a nickel. It's a never-ending confiscation of wealth from money earners, uh, the people who are earning the money to the people who are just doubling it and loaning it out to people. But regardless, you would trust them a whole lot better if you knew those rules, if you could determine those rules that they play by, right? And if you could audit them, now imagine it's a live audit. It happens every 10 minutes. And not only that, it's not one bank, but it's a network of thousands of banks. 
And it's not just the fact that no money is being created or destroyed in the system. It's that only the owner of the money, only the person who has signed transactions has any authority to move the money. So you essentially have an account with 20 different banks, but you are the only one who can move the money. And if one of those banks tried to change the rules, you just evict them. You just kick them out of your network. Everyone just agrees they run the software for the same set of rules. And everyone is checking everyone else to make sure nobody cheats, that nobody can cheat. Nobody can take coins that don't belong to them within the rules of the system. And that's essentially what it is. It's a banking and currency network that basically has a proven set of rules that nobody can cheat. It doesn't matter if you're a government, politician, a bank with lots of power and money. The system is no different for you than it is from a person who has 10 cent to their name on the blockchain. You know, I love this way to describe it. And I think it really is a great segue into something I want to discuss today, which is really the philosophy of Bitcoin and in the community most passionate about it, because you've just kind of outlined really the stark difference between, you know, okay, what's Bitcoin and then traditional banking or currencies and things like that and how our traditional financial systems run. It seems like they're almost competing ideals. Oh, yeah. You know, you have these traditional financial worlds, and then you have this new world of cryptocurrency and blockchain and this kind of thing. Mm Mm-hmm. So number one, do you think that's accurate to say, just so we're on the same page? Absolutely, without question, yeah. Great. So then, if possible, how would you really describe the philosophy of those who are truly passionate about Bitcoin or the philosophy of Bitcoin itself, what it is and what it can be? I would sum up the legacy system as a, quote, trust me, I'm more important than you, or I have this occupation, or I have this social standing, or I have this reputation, trust me, I'm right about this. And that's basically it. You don't get to verify. You trust people based on their position, their class, their authority. And you don't really have any other option. Like you said, I have to trust my bank, you know, and if they are screwing me, well, what are you going to do? What's your option? Go to another bank. (laughs) Exactly. And Bitcoin is literally the polar opposite. It's absolute complete openness. It's nothing about the rules, nothing about the amount of currency, nothing about the monetary theory in any way is obscured. It's 100% open and open source. You can modify it and play with it on your computer, but you have to be playing by the same rules to be playing on the network. So it is more open than anything could possibly be open, pretty much. And It's got nothing to do with trust. It's that, no, I'm not trusting anything. I'm going to verify. Full audit or nothing. I don't care what your class is. I don't care what your religion is or your skin color. None of that matters because I verify the rules 100% and I could care less whether you're a six-year-old kid in Bangladesh who wants to trade with me or a multi-billion dollar oil tycoon because I know neither one of them have any power to manipulate the rules in their favor or vice versa. Right, right. It's such an interesting thing too because then you think about you know, traditional currencies and and fiat-backed currencies where, you know, you talk about trust. It's like, well, I'm trusting that when I have this dollar, that it's worth a dollar Mm -hmm. and it's it's backed up by the tanks that the U.S. government has and stuff like that, you Mm -hmm. know, (laughs) and that the U.S. government is going to keep running and then it'll be okay and it's still going to be worth a dollar tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying is is, is it's such a different thing because it's like, it doesn't matter if the U.S. government gets overthrown tomorrow in some major coup, (laughs) exactly, the Bitcoin is still going to be the Bitcoin. Yeah. I mean, think about it. If China invaded and took over the U.S. and the dollar, all those policies would change immediately. Right. Right. And you also have to trust the dollar's worth something because all the countries that the U.S. has coerced into using dollars to do business with them are still going to do that tomorrow. They need to buy the oil with US dollars and not Chinese yuan or rubles or whatever it is. Because if any, if a couple of major countries made that decision, your dollars would buy you a whole lot less at the store and you wouldn't know why. You're like, why is gas $6 a gallon? It's because all of those oil countries do business in the dollar. And if they stopped, 
all of it would be up for grabs again. Those policies, those rules, who's in charge defines those things. And in Bitcoin, that's not the case. Which rules you choose to follow is how it's defined. It's solely up to the sovereign individual. You get to pick your rules. You don't get to pick somebody else's rules. They can pick different ones than you do. But that's why there's a shelling point on Bitcoin. The rules are kind of like a base protocol for interacting. Everybody says hello. Everybody shakes hands. Everybody says bye before they get off the phone. You know, There's a shelling point on this common thing that everybody can just, there's a least common denominator of interaction. And that's the Bitcoin monetary policy. Doesn't make sense to change it because how are you going to convince 100 million people to change their monetary policy? It's just not going to happen. (laughs) (laughs) Right, right. Now, this leads to my next question, which is, okay, so we've established we've got these two different kinds of philosophies. One of them, this, this more traditional financial economy, it's been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, and it's mainstream, and we have huge businesses and organizations and powerful people all with vested interest in these traditional systems. And and quite frankly, everything's set up to make all these traditional systems function. Our society has been built around them. Mm -hmm. What do you think the key is for Bitcoin to gain more mainstream acceptance to business owners like the ones that we help set up with credit card processing to get them to say, we want to be able to accept Bitcoin. We want our customers to pay us in Bitcoin. And what are the keys to getting these titans in payments and finance, these huge card companies, these big banks and all this to, to fully embrace Bitcoin? I actually think it's really a natural process. And I think it's been happening. I think Bitcoin's creation was part of the process that's been unfolding for like 20 years, is just a growing discontent and distrust. Because all of the layers of trust in our system have been blatantly abused across the board. And it's finally becoming obvious to people that that's the case, that that journalism is a joke, that the politicians have never said anything truthful ever. They say what people want to hear, (laughs) and then they do whatever they want in these 3,000-page bills that nobody even reads, and they call it Happy Things for Everyone Act. And everybody buys it hook, line, and sinker. People are beginning to realize that they just can't trust anyone because nothing is verified. It's all based on class. It's all based on authority. And this is with a caveat. These are heavy generalizations, but you see it. We're having these huge culture clashes now and why politics is now the center of everything and elections last the whole four years to the next election now, as all everybody talks about. And it's absolutely infuriating sometimes. But That breakdown of trust, I think, is exactly what drives people to things like Bitcoin that are completely open and don't require that authority or trust. I think that's why it exists. And then I also think it's part for people to realize that it's not a payment system. That's not what the blockchain is. It's a consensus system. It's about setting up a system of rules. And when people want to hold their wealth in Bitcoin – When the customer wants to hold their wealth in Bitcoin, even if it's just a little bit because they're not 100% sure about the dollar anymore or once they realize that that trust is falling away, I think they will seek out alternatives. But there needs to be a pressure. You know, people won't fix things if they don't think there's a problem. You know, you don't blindly go out and just buy new tires because you think you could benefit from new tires. You realize, oh, my God, my tires are bald or you slip on the road one day in the rain, you know, and you're like, oh, I need new tires. To break out of people's habits and patterns of how they do things and how they think of things, there has to be some sort of pressure. I think it's already been brewing for a very long time, and I think it's an ongoing process. But I don't think of Bitcoin as a payment system. I think of it as a trust and consensus system. So I think that's the major play right there is showing people that contracts in Bitcoin can't be cheated, that... Um, value held in Bitcoin uh, can't be manipulated by the people who are manipulating the value in your house or these other contracts that, you know, can just be politically wiped away one day, you know, they're good until the next president is in line, you know, in line. And I think this is an interesting point you make in that you talk about this erosion of trust. And I I think I just keep thinking of the 2008 financial crisis, Mm -hmm. all that went into that, that was just 
something that really took the wind out of a lot of people as like, wow, like so the, the economy can just get absolutely hammered because of the decisions of a few people in wealthy banks and things like that. Just this, these massive organizations where no one's looking at, you know, no one's looking at what these mortgages are. No one's looking at all this kind of stuff. And then up oh, actually now we're screwed. And then as we saw what happened, the average Joe's got, got stuck with the bill. <laughs> and it makes sense to me. What you're saying is, is that when you have these two philosophies, getting people over to the other philosophy, it's just, well, as that trust gets eroded and then they have that desire to find something else, what's better? What's more transparent? Bitcoin seems like, well, maybe that's that solution right there. Yeah. And I think just continued development in making it accessible to people, just being there, Bitcoin continues to exist and it continues to get easier to use and easier to onboard with the software that there will just continually be these little pressures like dominoes all around the world that keep happening. And every time it happens, rather than you know, looking at the batch of currencies and being like, okay, I want to move my money out of boulevards and put it into the dollar, or I want to put it into Chinese yuan. Now your options are the dollar to yuan and Bitcoin. Right. Every single time there's this, it will grab this new little portion of the next pressure or breakdown of trust somewhere and people will realize what a profoundly different alternative Bitcoin is to everything that we're used to and how foundational it is. Money is at the core of everything we do. I mean, everything. Name me one thing that you do that doesn't rely on you to trade with someone else to do it. You could think it's like, oh, well, I did my renovation. It's like, and which tool did you make with your bare hands? <laughs> like, like none of it. Everyone who made those tools didn't make the things. You know, somebody took the wood and the metal from someone else and then, you know, probably someone, a third person forged it, a fifth and six thousandth person mined it in India or, you know, Russia, who knows where it came from. The number of people that touch and cooperate just to make something as basic as a hammer or a pencil. Eye pencil is a brilliant, brilliant piece that I've actually read on the show from uh, Leonard Reed talking about like all the complexities, basically starting with the foundational thing that nobody in the world can make a pencil. And yeah. then basically proves his point. It's like, who can get the rubber from South America? Who can mine the graphite from Russia? You know, like, and he just goes through each individual piece. It would take an entire lifetime and then some to learn all of the skills, go to all of the places and accomplish all of the things just to make a pencil, which you can buy for a nickel or probably get for free if you just ask somebody for a pencil. Something so unbelievably complex is touched by tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of different people and interactions. Bitcoin, changing that one thing, it's like changing DNA. You know, it, it, it's really like the DNA of society and how people organize. Like DNA is just GTAC. It's just four proteins. But from that is extrapolated every organ in our body, every hormonal process that we have, whether or not we're a man or a woman, the color of our hair, like everything is built from those four proteins. And that's it at the base. But if you changed the G protein just a little bit, you'd have an organism that looked nothing like anything that we are today. Like it would absolutely reorganize every, it would redefine every piece of the entire totem pole of complexity that we are. And Bitcoin and money is like that for society. When you make a small change at a foundational level, nothing is untouched. It might take 50 years, it might take 100 years, but as this type of technology and means of consensus and trust is extended and applied to everywhere we need trust and everywhere we want consensus without violence, we want cooperation without argument, when it touches all of those areas, finally, like society just will not be organized the same way it is today. Um, and the internet has already begun to change that in a major, major way. But I think Bitcoin is going to have an even greater impact. Absolutely. And I think one thing I would add to this, you know, you'd mentioned earlier, you were talking about, you know, Bitcoin is not a payment system. And, you know, I've talked to so many different folks in the world of Bitcoin. The phrase, it's a store of value is something that uh, I've heard multiple people mention. And 
in terms of, I want to mention this for our listeners, in terms of our world of payments and credit card processing and these kinds of things, Bitcoin, it can be the underlying thing and that there are systems right now being developed and companies working on how do we have the base of Bitcoin and things like the Lightning Network or what have you, where that is now facilitating the payments aspect of it. So you're not necessarily having to just deal in Bitcoin, but you have these other systems that are kind of attached to it. And that's what's facilitating the the transactional nature of our world, right? Yeah, very much layered like the internet in that way. The store of value thing, I always kind of went back from to that too, but I always had like a bit of an asterisk in my mind about that. There, there was always something a little bit off because – Obviously, it's not a store of value in the fact that in six months, it's going to be worth exactly what it is today. Like this, right. that's kind of a misnomer. To me, it seems like more of a, it's like a store of a rule set. It's a store of agreement and people will value that differently. Because of that, its value will not ever be consistent. It will be stable after, you know, it reaches that S curve of adoption just because anything with high liquidity in a broad market is stable. That's how you get stability. But that is the only way to get stability. You can't get stability in an illiquid and small, fast growing market. Thinking store of value means stability. You don't get that until the end game. That's stage four. Mm -hmm. And but what it is, is is an undeniable, verifiable store of ownership and agreement. Like rules of ownership and the actual ownership ledger of who owns it. And I think without a doubt, the longer time span you have, people will value that more and more and more. That's what makes it a store of value. Not because we know what its value is going to be next year or a week from now, because we don't. But do you think people will value a completely sovereign ledger of ownership? Do you think people will value a completely sovereign and completely provable set of rules to interact with each other that can't be manipulated? Absolutely. Anybody who thinks that's not true, I think, is just either ignorant or trying really, really hard to convince themselves that the old way of doing things is just the way it's always going to be. Right. Now, you're a Bitcoin maximalist. To an extent, yes. To an extent, to an extent. Do you think there will be another cryptocurrency that will emerge and really challenge Bitcoin for the number one spot? If so, which crypto and, and why or why not? Well, currency is kind of a continuum. There are no set walls between what's a money and what's a security or what's a token. All these things are really vague ideas when you really break it down. And the roles are even contradictory sometimes in some of the monetary theories that you look at. You know, to be a money, it has to be a medium of exchange. But gold isn't a medium of exchange, but it's still used as money. I mean, you look at central banks buying and trading gold since the 2008 financial crisis, and you know gold is money because they're scared to death. They're soaking it up just as fast as they can go. And uh, not paper gold, real gold. <laughs> but uh, those definitions are really obscure. But I think... Because networks fall on shelling points and people fall on shelling points. We are social beings. That, that's it. We are constantly striving to get along because we don't want to get hurt and we don't like hurting other people. And that's just kind of – you would think that even though the prevailing sentiment is actually different, like how many times do you punch somebody in the day? You know, like right. how many times do you just scream and try to choke out the person at the grocery store that you bumped into or that kind of gave you a snitty look, you know, when you're checking out or something like it just doesn't happen. Like people vastly more often are getting along than they are doing anything else. We're trying to cooperate more often than not. We're trying really, really hard. It doesn't always work, but we're trying. Because of that, I think we will go – there will be a shelling point on the most dominant, most secure, most trust minimized means of ownership. And I think that will be Bitcoin. But as far as other tokens and stuff, I mean, Apple stock is a token, quote unquote. And there was over a trillion dollars at one point stored in that token. Mm. It's a security, but if it's completely open and tradable, maybe somebody will use it as a means of payment if it's on an open global network. But I don't think that's 
necessarily money Mm -hmm. because it's just a continuum because there's so many gray areas. I think, quote unquote, Bitcoin maximalism could be fulfilled with just 50 percent of what is thought of as currency money being in Bitcoin and the next 2000 being split up with the the other 50 percent. So maybe there's another one with 25 percent of, you know, the main trade uh, value in the same way that there's a couple of protocols that are used on the internet, but TCP IP vastly out dominates the others. It's just, there will always be certain types of maybe contracts or agreements. We're just having a backup, just having a fail safe protocol that if something goes wrong with Bitcoin or Bitcoin's too slow or something for this, that, or the other, there will always be specific use cases that I think may have some other token. There's always airline miles. There's always Apple stock. There's always, you know, Starbucks points. There's so many other things that are tokenized and that people store value in for sometimes short periods and sometimes incredibly long periods of time that there's no way there's just going to be one currency. That's just not how the world works. Like you can look at it today. There are billions of tokens. It's just the fact. Sure. But there's also the US dollar. There's also gold. And I think in the crypto economy, that will be Bitcoin because I've not seen anything that competes with it on the one area that deeply differentiates cryptocurrency from anything else. And that is the degree of trust required and degree of validity, like verifiability possible within the system. And I think that makes Bitcoin the king and really not very well challenged by any of the other ones at the moment. Absolutely. Okay. We have a segment that we like to end with, which is our fast five questions, rapid fire. Guy, are you ready? I think I'm ready. (laughs) (laughs) Make a prediction about the future of Bitcoin that you expect will happen in the next 12 to 24 months. Uh, A major government will outlaw it or start to try to fight it. And we will also start into another bull run. (laughs) <laughs> All right, Both I like of those it. things I have, think will happen within two years. What's one cool piece of technology, either payments and fintech related or not, but unrelated to Bitcoin specifically that you've come across recently that impressed you? This is technically not unrelated to Bitcoin, but just Cash App um, in general. I've never really used it much, but because they started accepting Bitcoin, I started using it. And I've really, really liked just the app in general. So Probably that, even aside from the fact that you can buy Bitcoin in it, was just, it was a really good app that I've been avoiding for years and years and just finally, <laughs> you know, broke down and started using and I really, really like it. So, For sure. In the next five years, most people around the world will make a purchase with either Bitcoin, Apple Pay, some other thing. Which one and why? I think they'll still use Apple Pay, but they will be spending Bitcoin through it. I like that. I like that. It, you know, usually people go one or the other and I like the Apple Pay, but they're they're spending Bitcoin through it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the open source software will still be a minority of the market. I think it will be the back end of most of the major businesses and services and stuff. And there will be a large subset of consumers that want to run their own node or actually learn about it and are fascinated by it. But I think most of it will be, you know, third party like business services that just make it so that people can be exposed, they have their value stored in Bitcoin, but they're still using the same app they were using before. What's one piece of advice you would have for someone who, you know, maybe they're listening to this show and now they're considering investing in Bitcoin or getting involved with building a business or technology around Bitcoin? What's one piece of advice you'd have for them? Um, Listen to the Crypto Economy Podcast. (laughs) Uh, Learn. Be careful. These are still early days. Like people are constantly thinking, it's like, oh, this, the gig's up, it's 10 years and it hasn't caught mainstream adoption. No, this is a 30 to 50 year plan um, and it's going to go in major waves and things are going to happen so fast that it's, you're just going to feel blindsided by it every time something happens. So take it slow. Like there's not really any rush. Learn what you need to learn to be safe. And the Crypto Economy podcast is probably a really good way to do that. (laughs) (laughs) Get the plug in there. I love it. (laughs) What's the best business advice you've ever received and from whom? That's a good question. Start. Just start. And I can't 
come up off the top of my head who it was. Um, but my second most important piece of advice, which I still still fail at quite a bit and wish I'm trying to get into a habit of doing it more often and being better about it, delegate. Yeah. Delegate. Get somebody else to do the menial work. People love to get paid to do menial work and the upfront investment is going to be worth it. Don't waste that first six months of strong energy, like emotional energy that you have with your project by trying to make these crappy little free things work that don't scale and that you're going to have to change after you actually get some followers, you know, like just do it and delegate the work to other people so that it's sustainable. And after you get that first six months of emotional energy, when it starts to die down, everything's rolling. So you don't need that same amount of energy anymore. I think that was really Jason Stapleton's show that I heard that one on recently or the six figure grind. Both of those are really good podcasts about entrepreneurship and stuff that have a lot of really good stuff. Stapleton in particular has a lot of good episodes recently. Yeah, I think that's fantastic advice. And that's something I, uh, I fail at sometimes because I also, I don't know, I'm one of those people where I like to, I like to get in there and I like to make sure that everything's do, being done right and all this kind of stuff. And there's a lot to be said for like letting go and letting, you know, some of those tasks that, that are more menial or, or what have you, trusting someone else to do that. So then you can free yourself up to focus on, especially in business, the things that are, higher touch that will drive even more value because that's what you're there for. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And another good thing with first off with like a menial task or whatever is like, I'm a perfectionist and controlling, like I want to do it myself, you know, just like, yeah. Said. And like, I think, Oh, $20 for this. I could do this. But when you're doing it, when it takes you five minutes every single day, like you think, how much time have I wasted at the end of the month? And think you're probably going to run into problems and every fifth day that five minutes is going to turn into 30 or 45. Like how much time are you wasting making low value decisions and doing petty work like typing something in or getting the format right on something that someone else could be doing? Your time's worth more than that. There's no billion dollar company run by one person. Right. Success doesn't happen because you're doing it all yourself and you can do it all yourself. The doctor might be a better truck driver, but he's not going to deliver his own medicines to his office. <laughs> he's going to be the doctor because that's the higher value position. He's more valuable there than he is as a truck driver. Do the things that are important to getting the business or the project or whatever it is. The decisions, you know, the important decisions get done and delegate everything that can be delegated. I'm trying desperately to follow my own rule in that regard, and I'm getting there. I'll keep telling everybody else to do it, and then maybe I'll maybe I'll break down <laughs> and do it myself. <laughs> Say it enough times, so yes, you'll yes, internalize keep, it. Keep doing it. There you go. Guy, I wanted to thank you so, so much for joining me on the show today. This was a, a really great discussion. Yeah, I appreciate it. I had a lot of fun, man. And uh, one more time, let's get one more plug in. Where can people go if they want to connect with you, listen to your show? Yeah, um, the Crypto Economy podcast, I read, I literally, I go through hundreds of articles and um, I'm now on like 220 or something like that for my reads. So you can subscribe there and I'm also expanding that out. I'm doing interviews and solo episodes now. Um, so I'm broadening quite a bit of what I'm doing with that podcast. And you can pretty much find all of that stuff on CryptoEconomy.life which is basically my main my main hub where I'm trying to do all this stuff off of. So the Crypto Economy podcast on pretty much any podcast uh, platform and uh, CryptoEconomy.life. Love it. Thanks so much, Guy. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me on. So that completes our show today. Thanks so much for listening. And don't forget to subscribe if you like the show. You can do so on iTunes, Google Play, and many other platforms. So until next time, I'll see you then. And thanks again for listening. Thank you for listening to another episode of PayPod, brought to you by Soar Payments. Soar Payments is a leading merchant services provider for e-commerce, high risk, and hard to place businesses. If you'd like to get the latest PayPod episode sent to you automatically, subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher, or visit soarpay.com slash podcast. Podcast.